Today's video is brought to you by a brand new sponsor called Zbiotics, and I think you guys are gonna like this one. Look, tell me if this sounds familiar. You gone out, you know, for a couple of drinks after work, and it's unfortunately Tuesday, and well, you've got work on Wednesday, because of course you do, and well, you've just had a little bit too much, and the next day you just don't feel your best, do you? That fifth cocktail, maybe it was a bit of a mistake. No, it's no fun, we've all been there, but fortunately, Zbiotics is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It's like the first ever, and it helps you feel better the next day. Here's the deal. You buy some Zbiotics, you drink it before you consume any alcohol, and then you wake up the next day and you feel good. And that's it. That's because Zbiotics is a probiotic that breaks down the byproduct of alcohol, which is the thing that's mostly responsible for rough mornings after drinking. Look, everybody always thinks that it's the dehydration, but it's not. There's a toxic byproduct of alcohol that builds up in your gut, and Zbiotics produces an enzyme, sort of like what your liver does, to help counteract that byproduct. Now, before you run and buy 57 bottles of Zbiotics, it's important to understand that it can't help you sober up, and it can't make you blissfully well rested if you only slept for three hours. It's not magic. It's science. But like I said, it does a great job of getting rid of those nasty byproducts in your system. Right now, you guys can get 15% off your first order of Zbiotics by going to zbiotics.com slash brainfood. That's zbiotics.com slash brainfood. Or just click the link below and use the code brainfood at checkout. Enjoy your drinks and enjoy Zbiotics. And enjoy today's video. The first Earthlings sent into space were brave, calm under pressure, and heroic. They were also not human, and many of them were furry. Yes, before Apollo 13, Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, and Yuri Gagarin, humans sent several other life forms into space. Here is the little told story of these mostly cute and cuddly astronauts. The V-2 rocket, developed by the Germans, was the first man-made object to reach the so-called fringes of space. The first test flight of this massive rocket was in May of 1944. When successful, at least by the standards of the day, it was naturally rushed into war. By August 1944, Nazi Germany was raining down V-2 rockets on the city of London. Upon the end of the war, the Allied forces were quite familiar with the potential of these V-2 rockets and scoured the world for V-2 rocket parts, as well as German engineers and scientists who knew how to build them. It became a competition between Britain, the US, and the Soviet Union to see who could develop their own better version of the V-2 the quickest. As the Cold War heated up between the Soviets and the Americans, it also became a matter of national security. On February the 20th, 1947, a mere 22 months after Germany's surrender, the United States launched a captured V-2 rocket with fruit flies aboard. These humble fruit flies were the first earthly beings outside of microbes in space, or so our blizzard overlords would have you believe. From its launch site in New Mexico, the rocket traveled to an altitude of about 68 miles, going past the Kármán line on a 3-minute, 10-second suborbital mission. The purpose of this test was to determine the effects of high acceleration and cosmic radiation exposure on living beings. When the scientists retrieved the rocket, they found the fruit flies alive and well, proving once again how difficult it is to get rid of these annoying creatures once they establish themselves. 16 months later, in June of 1948, the United States upped the ante by sending Albert, a rhesus monkey, on a trip aboard a V-2 rocket. It. Nine pounds underneath sitized, he was placed into the nose of a V-2, which only went to an altitude of 39 miles. Unfortunately, scientists and his human handlers speculated that he died even before takeoff, having suffocated in the cramped capsule. Even if he was alive, the parachute mechanism failed and the rocket had a violent crash landing. At least the name Albert lived on, though, because from that point on, the preceding tests involving monkeys in the United States were known as the Albert Project. Almost exactly a year later, the US tried again. They sent another rhesus monkey, appropriately named Albert II, into the sky aboard a V-2. This time, they gave him more breathing room with a less cramped space. Also anesthetized, he reached an altitude of 83 miles, making him the first primate in space. While he was alive through about 99% of the flight, he was killed again upon impact when the parachute mechanism failed to work properly. You had one job, parachute design team. It was around this time that the Soviet Union were planning the next evolution of biological objects being sent into space. Under the utmost secrecy due to the fear of spies, to the point that even many of the scientists working on the project didn't know exactly what was going on, the Soviets were sending rabbits, mice, and rats. And ultimately, they prepared to send dogs into the great beyond. Called future space scouts, their reasoning for selecting dogs was more practical and cost-efficient than science-based. First of all, as later stated by Vladimir Yazdovsky, the heads of the Biological Program for Space Research at the Institute of Aviation Medicine in Moscow, quote, We selected dogs as biological objects because their physiology is very well suited. They adapt well to training and are very communicative and social with people. 
Also, they were plentiful and cheap. Moscow was awash with stray dogs, and finding ones to meet the space program's exact specifications wasn't particularly hard. The dogs had to be healthy, adults, between 13 and 15 pounds, light coat color, more easily seen in photos, which was a huge part of the publicity, mixed breed for their supposed hardiness, and female. Female dog's anatomy made it easier for the suit and sanitation equipment to be properly fitted. The dogs were trained for space travel by being put into smaller and smaller crates, which was an attempt to get them accustomed to the restrictive space that they would have to deal with during the flight. They also had to get used to all of the suits, contraptions, and equipment that they'd be wearing, including including a cumbersome sanitation device. They were fed an energy gelatinous food made up of breadcrumbs, powdered meat, and beef fat. Many of the dogs simply didn't react well to all of this and were not allowed to train. The ones that did had numerous health issues later, including kidney failure and constipation. In 1951, the first two dogs, Desik and Saigon, Russian for Gypsy, uh, were launched, reaching an altitude of 62 miles. Upon coming back to Earth, parachute deployed correctly, so Soviets won, United States zero. When the scientists opened the hatch, they were greeted by barking. Desik and Saigon had survived, becoming the first living beings outside of flies and microbes to successfully recover from a space flight. The next week, Desik was sent on another flight with a dog named Lisa. He was fine until the parachute failed to deploy and they were both killed. Upon learning about the accident, the head of the Commission for the Investigation of the Upper Atmosphere, Anatoly Blaganorov, immediately went into hiding to try and avoid his inevitable fate once Jardani Jobovanich, aka John Wick, learned of this. To further up his odds of Mr. Wick forgiving him, he declared that Saigon was going to be retired from space flight and come home with him to be his pet. After Desik and Saigon, the Soviets would send many dogs into space over the next six years. A few died due to mechanical failures, but many survived. The scientists and engineers studied the dogs' vital signs, their post-flight health checkups, and observed the massive amount of film taken during the flights. They learned that while the dogs got agitated, disorientated, and perhaps dad motion sick, they were pretty much okay health-wise during space flight. This set the stage for Latka and her travels aboard Sputnik 2. Kudryavka, or Laika, which was Russian for Barker, initially wasn't the best best candidate for the historic flight and the designation of being the most famous dog in history. Another martyr named Albina was, but according to the book Animals in Space, from research rockets to the space shuttle, she just had a litter of puppies and was everybody's favorite. The scientists didn't want to sacrifice her for what was a suicide mission. Latka was highly sociable, patient, and scored well under harsh circumstances, and critically here had no association with any dog of Baba Yaga's, so she was chosen. Laika was put under intense training and preparation leading up to her flight. She had electrodes inserted into her to detect vital signs and heart activity. She was fitted for suits and held in preparation crates. On October the 4th, 1957, about a month before Laika's launch, Sputnik 1 launched into the skies and became the first artificial satellite in space. This energized the Soviet people, and when Laika was first introduced via radio to the population on October the 27th, 1957, she delightfully barked into the microphone. Posters, figurines, and even comic books were quickly mocked up with Laika's likeness. She was the most famous dog in history and ready to go into space. Laika was kept in the capsule for three days before she was launched. During this time, the handlers were so concerned about her that they had to beg the head engineer to give her squirts of water to ensure that she survived until takeoff. Finally, on November the 4th, she and Sputnik 2 were launched. Now, according to records at the time, Laika was the first Earth-born living creature to go into orbit. This might not be entirely truthful, though. According to reports that only came out in 2002, Laika may have perished about five hours into the flight due to overheating, thermal insulation failure, and possibly even stress exacerbated by overheating. It's not known if she was even alive while Sputnik 2 orbited. This was not made public knowledge at the time, as the world's newspapers carried headlines much like this one from the New York Times. Soviet fires new satellite-carrying dog. In fact, as Sputnik orbited over the next four days, Russian press releases kept referencing Laika's good condition. Regardless of when she died, Laika was, controversially, never meant to be recovered, and after 2,570 orbits on April 14, 1958, Sputnik 2 broke apart and disintegrated in the Earth's atmosphere. One of the scientists involved in Laika's mission, Oleg Gazenko, later stated of this, Work with animals is a source of suffering to all of us. The more time passes, the more I'm sorry about it. We shouldn't have done it. We did not learn enough from this mission to justify the death of the dog. Meanwhile, the Americans still had monkeys. And this brings us back to the Alberts. As noted, Albert 1 and 2 didn't have much luck with the whole living thing, nor did Alberts 3, 4, or 5. All were sent into space, and none survived, either due to impact, mid-air explosion, or a complication during the flight. Until 1959, no primate had ever returned to Earth from space alive. 
alive. Determined to finally get their efforts right, NASA chose two monkeys for its next mission in 1959. The first was another female rhesus monkey named Abel. Picked from a lot of 24 that came from a zoo in Independence, Kansas, Abel was chosen for the mission with direct orders from President Eisenhower. This was due to the original primate space cadet being Indian-born, and since some in India consider the rhesus monkey sacred, President Eisenhower thought it would be best for political reasons to send an American-born rhesus monkey to space instead. The second monkey chosen for the mission was also selected from a large group, this time of 25, purchased from a pet shop in Miami. The two-year-old, one-pound South American-born Miss Baker was determined to be the best of the bunch. Due to her propensity to not seem to mind being confined for long periods, her docile nature, intelligence seeming to enjoy being handled, and general friendliness towards humans, with her nickname becoming TLC, tender loving care. With the selections made, the two monkeys were sent into training for their date with history. Each monkey was fitted with specially made suits with sensors to track pulse, body temperature, and movement. Abel's was tightly fitted, allowing for minimal movement, but giving her enough room to perform a simple task on the flight. She was trained to press a button whenever a red light flashed, so that the humans below could test her coordination and focus while in space. Miss Baker's suit was lined with foam, rubber, and leather, and she was fitted into a very small life support capsule nearly the size of a thermos, which which gave her no room to move. Both monkeys also had adorable little fiberglass helmets. At 2.35 a.m. on May 28, 1959, the giant Jupiter AM-18 blasted into the sky, reaching speeds in excess of 10,000 miles per hour, with the two primates seated not so comfortably in the nose cone. The flight lasted about 17 minutes before they plunged into the ocean about 250 miles southeast of San Juan, Puerto Rico. The recovery team immediately went in search of them. Initially, there was fear that the capsule had sunk, much like a predecessor of theirs. But then the crew spotted it bobbing in the water. Shortly thereafter, a message came through to Cape Canaveral saying, Abel Baker perfect, no injuries or other difficulties. The two monkeys had become the first primates to travel in space and then return home safely. Abel and Miss Baker arrived back to the United States to a hero's welcome, first going to their own private officer quarters with recently installed air conditioning. Then they were flown to Washington, D.C. for a welcome back press conference. Their correspondents pushed each other and clambered over chairs to get closer to the monkeys, reported the New York Times. As for the heroes themselves, the monkeys were far less excited than the humans. They munched on peanuts and crackers. Abel and Miss Baker were awarded medals and merits. A month later, they were on the cover of Life magazine. For Abel, unfortunately, fame was short-lived. It was supposed to be a minor operation, one simply to remove leftover electrodes from the trip four days earlier. Doctors were very careful with her, but after administering anesthesia, the monkey inexplicably went into cardiac arrest and stopped breathing. After spending nearly two hours attempting to save Abel's life, the doctors working on her accepted the inevitable. She was gone. Abel died on the 1st of June 1959, only days after returning home. Today, she's preserved and on display at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. As for Miss Baker, she went on to live a life worthy of an American hero. After a media blitz, she retired to the Naval Air Training Station in Pensacola in a custom-built home. Three years later, she was married to a Peruvian squirrel monkey called Big George in a nice naval ceremony. In 1971, the happy couple moved to U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama. In 1979, Big George died, but after a brief mourning period, Miss Baker remarried. In a ceremony in Huntsville, she took her second vows with a monkey named Norman. Fitted with a wedding dress, Miss Baker tore it off, presumably eager to get to the spicy wedding night shenanigans. Five years later, on November 29th, Miss Baker died, living to the ripe old age of 27. In addition to being a space explorer, Miss Baker was also the oldest living squirrel monkey on record. For reference, the average lifespan of a squirrel monkey in the wild is just 15 years and in captivity around 20. 300 people and Norman attended the funeral in Huntsville, Alabama, on the grounds of the United States Space and Rocket Center. She's buried at the Space Center with an off visited marker. While Miss Baker and Abel may not get the same recognition as Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong, they are perhaps among the most famous monkeys in history, getting the chance to do something most humans only ever dream about.